Chapter 10, Odd Number Problems 1 through 7. Number 1, describe the basic characteristics of an independent measures or between subject research study. So within the independent measures t-test, we utilize the between subject design, which means that in each Example, there are different participants. So each sample is made up of a, a separate group of um, individuals. So for example, we may have sample one and that's made up of individuals Alex and Ray and Tina and Esther and then sample two sample two is made up of um, different individuals let's say Lance and Noah and um, Mary and Martha. And so again, we, we have the creation of two samples. Each sample is made up of separate individuals, hence this idea of a t-test for independent sample means. So each sample is going to have its own statistics. We would have uh, average, <clears throat> we'd have sample size, We'd have variance, and we'd have standard deviation all for our first distribution. And similarly, we would have all those statistics for our second distribution. We would have an average, the sample size, the variance, and standard deviation. And having that information, uh, again, would be different for both of our samples. And this will be different from what we learned later in Chapter 11, which is referred to as within subject design. Within subject design is the same individuals being recycled or reused in every condition of the independent variable. And I just um, realized, you know, as I often do, my little typos, <laughs> writos as I call them, and that's not how you spell Noah. Sorry about that. I threw an extra H where it didn't belong. Um, but again, pointing out we have different individuals um, in each of our samples. Number two, if other factors are held constant, excuse me, this is number three. If other factors are held constant, explain how each of the following influences the value of the independent measures T statistic and the likelihood of rejecting the null. Again, um, the larger our T values, right, the larger the T value, the more likely it is to reject the null. And here in the center, we're going to have the null represented by the mean difference between the two populations, which is equal to zero. And our T values, the, the numeric value increases going out this way towards the tail and this way going out towards the tail. Again, these would be negative T values on this side and positive T values on this side. But the values themselves increase as we go out into the tail. So larger T values um, can be understood as greater likelihood of rejecting the null. So let's just consider our equation, our T equation. So um, T is equal to M minus, excuse me, M1 minus M2 minus mu1 minus mu2. Again, this second part of the equation is always equal to zero because it represents the null, the, saying that they're equal to one another, divided by the estimated standard error of the mean difference. So we've established these equations in a previous video. And now we're saying, what if an increase in the mean difference were to occur? So if this part of the equation, the mean difference, Remember that the um, researchers are always hoping for large mean difference and low variability. Those, um, the combination of those, those scenarios will produce the highest T value. So if we have an increase in the mean difference, so an increase 
in the mean difference will result in a larger t value and greater likelihood of rejecting the null. Okay, so as the mean difference increases, our t is going to increase. Larger t's are pushed out further into the tail, increasing the likelihood of rejecting the null. B says, what if we have an increase in the number of scores? We've learned this relationship back in chapter eight. We, we learned, and what I shared with you is as n increases, standard error, and in this case it would be estimated standard error, but nonetheless standard error um, decreases and t increases, so our t statistic increases. So um, again, if we what we've learned, um, and I'm just going to change two little things just to make it look a little nicer. T statistic or T statistic will increase. Um, again, we we've just have seen that over and over again with practice that as n um, increases our standard error decreases, the variability decreases, and then um, numerically speaking, in terms of our t-value, we get higher t's. So in this case, we're saying that because n increases, this value, the denominator of our t equation is going to decrease. If we divide by a smaller number, the quotient, the t to statistic in this um, situation, is going to become larger. So again, n will increase standard error, variability decreases, variability or standard error is the, the denominator of the equation, and therefore it's going to produce a larger t value. So larger t values, we increase the likelihood of um, rejecting the null. So in this case, we can understand um, the t increases, so larger, larger t values increase likelihood of rejecting the null. Again, just the, the standard, the, the researcher hopes for large mean difference, low variability. And we have no control over the mean difference, but the variability can be manipulated by using larger sample sizes. And then finally, an increase in variance for each sample. So we know that as the variability of the samples increase, the more um, difficult it will be to detect differences between these groups. So as Variability increases, the standard standard error, and again I'm saying standard error, but recognize it would be estimated standard error in this chapter, um, the standard error increases. and the t value decreases. So again, larger sample variance is going to increase the denominator of our equation. Again, we're still talking about um, this value here, right, the denominator of our t equation. If that becomes larger due to an increase in variance of the samples, then our t value is going to decrease because we're dividing by a larger number. Dividing by a larger number decreases the quotient. The quotient in this case would be our t statistic. So likelihood of rejecting the null decreases. This has been 
um, the pattern we've seen since chapter eight, how these variables change, how they're, mani um, they're being manipulated either by increasing or changing sample size, um, or just because of the variability that we see in, in the original samples themselves. They all have an impact on our T statistic. And again, we're hoping for large T values, the value itself. It could be a negative T out in the tail or a positive T out in the right tail. Um, but the larger that T value, the more likely it is that we get to reject the idea that these two values are equal to one another. Number five, one sample has sum of squared deviations equal to 36 and the second sample has sum of squared deviations equal to 18. If n is equal to 4 for both samples, find each of the sample variances and compute the pooled variance. And then we are to note, because the samples are of the same size, you should find that the pooled variance is exactly halfway between the two sample variances. So let's see what they mean by that. And we're going to calculate variance for our first um, sample. So variance for our first sample, our equation is SS1 over N1 minus 1, or we could think of it as SS over degrees of freedom, which I'll, I'll use more readily from this point forward. So our first sample, um, SS, is equal to 36. That was given. And we're told that the sample is equal to 4. Um, it's equal to 4 for both samples. So 4 minus 1 gives us 3. 3. So 36 divided by 3, we get 12. Okay. Now for our second sample, second sample, we have SS2 divided by degrees of freedom 2. And I should probably notate this one as degrees of freedom 1. And this as 1. When we have more than 1, we should pay uh, special attention to the subnotation. So our SS for our second distribution is equal to 18. And that sample was also equal to 4. So 4 minus 1 gives us 3. So 18 divided by 3 gives us 6. So we've just calculated the variance for each independent sample. Then we're asked to calculate what the pooled variance is. So let's do that over here. Pooled variance is equal to SS1 plus SS2 over degrees of freedom our first distribution and a two degrees of freedom for our second distribution. So we're just going to replace variables. The pooled variance is equal to 36 plus 18 over 3 plus 3. And if we do that calculation in our calculators, so 36 plus 18 divide by 6, so it's 54 divided by 6, and we get 9. 9, or pool variance. So again, given, considering these two distributions, we want to know what their pooled variance is, um, and what they indicated in this last part of that problem was that we would notice that the pooled variance exactly halfway in between the two sample variances. So what they're saying is if we were to take the average of these two, so if we average um, the variance of the two, 12 plus 6, so that would be 12 plus 6 divided by 2, right? If we just want to average those variances. So 12 plus 6 and divide by 2 and we get 9. Okay, so just showing that when our sample sizes are equal, the average of the two sample variances will be equivalent to our pooled variance. 
but when we have samples of different sizes, that won't be the case. So we should refrain from using the, this process of doing the independent sample variances and averaging them. Instead, we must use the pooled variance because this takes into account the differences in sample sizes. It would be rare in a real life research scenario that our samples would be equivalent. Um, people drop out of studies. Sometimes we can't recruit enough for one condition versus the other. So the M values aren't always the same. And as a result, the pooled variance will be affected by that. Um, well, I should say that the pooled variance will address that difference um, in, in that calculation. If we were just to average those two variances, it would be inequitable in instances where sample sizes are different. So that brings us to our next example. Again, we're going to calculate our um, independent um, sample variance for our first sample. So they gave us SS. Again, we're going to use the same values from up here. So 36, so SS over DF. So for our first sample, that would be 36 over 3. And we still get the same 12. And then our second sample variance is equal to SS, and again, sub 1, sub 1, sub 2, degrees of freedom, sub 2. So we have 18, 18, and um, I went through the, the first one quite fast, but the, the first sample is still 4, which is why it didn't change. But now our second sample is equal to 7, opposed to 4. So 7 minus 1, 7 minus 1 gives us 6. And now 18 divided by 6 gives us 3. So notice the difference in the um, sample variances that we calculated here. Next, we're asked to calculate the pooled variance given the difference in sample sizes. So pooled variance is equal to SS1 plus SS2 over degrees of freedom 1 plus degrees of freedom 2. So we have, we replace our variables, we have 36 plus, <clears throat> excuse me, 18 over 3 plus 6. So notice the, the denominator is different. So in our calculators, again, it will be 54, so 36 plus 18, 54, now divided by 9 we get, excuse me, excuse me, not divided, yes, divided by 9, and we get 6, 6. So the pooled variance is now equal to 6 because our sample sizes were different. Now let's go and average these two like we did before. So 12 plus 3 divided by 2. So if we do 12 plus 3, divide by 2, we get, in averaging that, we get 7.5. So notice that they're different. Over here, we had the same value because our ends were the same. Now our ends are different, and so we see that averaging the two independent variances gives us a different value than the pooled variance. Um, and then we can think about which um, variance is the pooled variance closer to. So if we look at the difference between 6 and 12 and 6 and 3, so again, now I'm talking about these values. Which one is it closest to? We will conclude that it's closer to 3, right? And why is that? The reason that it's closer to 3, it's pooled closer to um, the distribution that has a larger sample size. So our second distribution had a sample size of 7 in comparison to the first sample, which was equal to 4. So when we pull our variances, the end value, the end result, will be closest to the variance that contributed more um, values in that calculation. So again, we saw that averaging those two variances didn't produce the same value as our pooled variance. The pooled variance is a more accurate representation of combining these two samples. 
and again it's always going to be closer to the sample that had a larger sample size. Number seven, as noted on interpreting the estim estimated standard error, when two population means are equal, the estimated standard error for the independent measures t-test provides a measure of how much difference to expect between two sample means. For each of the following situations, assume that mu1 equals mu2 and calculate how much difference should be expected between the two samples. So essentially what they're asking us to calculate um, is the estimated standard error, which is equal to S M1 minus M2, and that's equal to our the square root of taking our pooled variance over our sample size for our first sample added to the pooled variance divided by sample size for our second sample. So in order to calculate that, we're going to need to calculate pooled variance because that wasn't given. What we were given were sample sizes and sum of square deviations for both samples. So we need to calculate our pooled variance. And we just learned how to do that, that um, pool variance is equal to SS1 plus SS2 over N1 plus, excuse me, not N1, degrees of freedom 1, well, added to degrees of freedom for a second distribution. I started to make the most common mistake um, that, that I make and that students also make um, here in the estimate center error, notice that the denominator is n, but when it's pooled variance, it's degrees of freedom. It's n minus 1. So I just want to warn you that I make that mistake. You may also make the mistake. I see students make the mistake um, often. So just make sure that pooled variance is always using degrees of freedom and not the sample size. All right, so now we have our equation. Let's just replace variables. So our sum of square deviations for our first sample was given. It's equal to 75 plus the sum of square deviations for our second sample, 135. And then um, our sample size for our first sample is equal to 6. So degrees of freedom would be 6 minus 1 gives us 5. And then sample size for our second sample is 10. 10 minus 1 is equal to 9. All right, so in our calculators, let's enter 75 plus 135. We get 210 over 14. So divide 210 in your calculator, divide by 14, and we get 15 as the pooled variance. That's our pooled variance for these two separate independent samples. Um, another common mistake that students make um, when doing the calculations, notice here in the estimated standard error, we have essentially these two different proportions, right, added together. And here we're taking values in the numerator, adding them together, and then the values in the denominator are being added together. So they're not separate, and I see students combine these two or separate them. In other words, um, mixing the two equations together and coming up with the incorrect answer. All right, so we have our pooled variance, and now we can calculate our estimated standard error of the mean, which was the original task. Now we can do so given our equation and the value of pooled variance, which is equal to 15. So again, our equation says our pooled variance, right, in this case, is equal to 15, we just solved that, over n. And in this first sample is equal to 6. Add it to 15, pooled variance, over sample size for a second sample, which is equal to 10. So if we do that, um, and I'm just going to make this a little smaller here. All right, um, so you can uh, approach this in, in a couple of different ways, um, given that they have, um, you can approach them as 
different proportions, right? 15 over 6 or 15 over 10. Add those proportions together and then take the square root. Okay, so if we take them as separate proportions, if we calculate 15 divided by 6 in your calculator, 15 divided by 6, we get 2.5. 2.5 plus 15 divided by 10 gives us 1.5. So now we can add those values together. And 2.5 plus 1.5 gives us 4. So we're now looking for the square root of 4, and that's equal to 2. Um, again, these are separate um, proportions, whereas in the pooled variance, we're adding those two values um, in the numerator and then dividing by the addition of the two separate values in the denominator. And here, there are two different proportions that we would um, solve independent of each other. And in this case, adding those two values together gives us 4. We take the square root of 4, and we get 2. So the question simply asked us to calculate the estimated standard error um, of these two samples. And um, they didn't really specifically say that, but we understood that given that they asked us to calculate a measure right here, a measure of how much difference to expect between the two sample means. Translation, estimated standard error. Okay, so on average, we would expect the difference between sample 1 minus sample 2 and mu 1 minus mu 2 when mu 1 minus mu 2 equals, oops, equals 0 to equal 2. I know that's a mouthful, but essentially we're saying that um, when we're comparing the, sam the difference between the samples, we expect that average difference to equal 2 when we compare that sample mean difference to the population mean difference, in this case, the null, which equals 0, that we'd expect that difference to equal 2. So we would expect, on average, the difference between m1 minus m2 and mu1 minus mu2 when mu1 minus mu2 is equal to 0 to equal 2 points. So on average, we'd expect the difference between those samples to equal 2. Okay, so B says, one sample has sample size of 6 with um, SS equal to 310, and the second sample has N equal to 10 with SS equal to 530. So again, we're going to calculate the estimated standard error of the mean. To do so, we're going to need our pooled variance, because our equation is equal to pooled variance over n1 plus pooled variance over n2. So let's calculate our pooled variance. Our pooled variance is equal to SS1 plus SS2 over degrees of freedom 1 plus degrees of freedom 2. We'll replace our variables. SS1 is equal to 310. That was a given. SS2, 530. Degrees of freedom 1, so n minus 1. 6 minus 1 gives us 5. Second sample size, 10. 10 minus 1 is equal to 9. So in our calculators, we would enter 310 plus 530, we get 840, 840 divided by 14, and we get pull variance equal to 60. So given that, we can calculate our estimated standard error of the mean. Again, the average difference between m1 minus m2 in relation to mu1 minus mu2. All right, so our equation is um, 
the pooled variance over n for our first sample. So we have pooled variance now, so it's equal to 60. n1 is equal to 6. Pooled variance again is equal to 60 over n2, which is equal to 10. So can we take these as independent fractions? Um, so 60 divided by 6 gives us 10. 60 divided by 10 gives us 6. So we are looking for the square root of 16, and that's equal to 4. So everything else remained the same. What we changed in this example was the SS value. So in C, it says in part B, the samples have larger variability, bigger SS values than in part 1, but the sample sizes are unchanged. How does the larger variability affect the magnitude of standard error in the sample mean? So we saw in the previous example, estimated standard error was equal to 2, and in this case, it's equal to 4. So we can um, conclude that larger ability of scores, right, which is reflected in the sum of squared of deviation values, so the larger variability of scores in each sample produces a larger estimated standard error. And when we're talking about um, our T equation, um, I'm going to write that up here just to give me some more room. Again, our T is equal to M1 minus M2 minus mu1 minus mu2. That's always equal to zero, comes from the null, over S sub M1 minus M2, our standard error. So in this case, we're saying as this value, as that, as that increases, Right, what happens? Our t value, our t statistic is going to decrease. Right, if you divide by a larger number, it's going to decrease the end product. So, larger variability of scores in each sample produces a larger estimated standard error and, I should say, and results in a smaller. T statistic, which decreases the likelihood of rejecting the null. So we talked about conceptually how these variables are related to one another, and here is a perfect example of showing that relationship, that as variability in each of the samples increase, denoted by a change and increase in SS for each sample, then the standard error, estimate standard error of the mean difference also increased. And as a result, our T statistic will inevitably decrease. Again, remember, the researcher hopes for large mean difference and low variability. So here we showed greater variability, decreased our T statistic, and also, as a result, decreased our likelihood of rejecting the null hypothesis.